I'm Laura Brill, and I'm a partner at a law firm in Los Angeles, California, Kendall, Brill, and Klieger. I've been involved in gay rights advocacy for a long time. What Lambda Legal does is it, it's the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization that works on protecting the civil rights of lesbians and gay men, bisexuals and transgender people, and people with HIV and AIDS really laying the groundwork for a lot of the cases that are now coming up through the courts about uh, marriage rights and other, other protections for the LGBT community. The gay rights movement does not come out of a history of slavery and disenfranchisement and Jim Crow laws, but at the same time we see uh, there were anti-miscegenation laws that were passed to essentially to dehumanize African Americans, to deem them less worthy than uh, white people for marriage. Also, um, uh, Hispanic people, uh, laws designed to discriminate against Asian people in California and elsewhere in the West. Um, and, and we see this use of marriage as you know, sort of a marker of human dignity and using that to, um, uh, to deem Gay people less worthy has many of the same impacts on gay people and uh, many of the same resonances as it does with uh, uh, racial minorities. The Defense of Marriage Act categorically excludes same-sex couples who are lawfully married under state law from receiving any of the benefits or having any of the rights or responsibilities uh, that married couples have under federal law. And it has enormous symbolic importance, both for just uh, refusing to give equal dignity to those marriage marriages, and it has enormous practical importance. So, for example, uh, widows and widowers who are in same-sex marriages that are recognized by the state can't get survivor's benefits under Social Security when heterosexual widows or widowers could. Military spouses don't have access to the enormous range of military benefits and support that are provided. It has effects on immigration where uh, married couples can immigrate uh, easily, but not if you're a same-sex married couple. Um, and even when your private employer tries to, tries to create equality, for example, by giving health benefits to married couples or domestic partners who are same-sex couples, uh, the federal law makes the employee pay taxes um, on those. So it, it ranges from uh, you know, sort of trivial small things to a huge array of life-changing um, uh, disabilities that, that the law creates. And that's what's before the Supreme Court now. There's a second aspect of the Defense of Marriage Act that isn't up for review. It provides that one state does not have to recognize marriages performed in other states. So, um, so that issue will be undecided to, uh, regardless of how the Defense of Marriage Act case comes out. A lot of people think that in Perry, the Supreme Court, the only decision the Supreme Court make, can make is, does everybody in the United States have the equal right of marriage or is there to be no uh, equal marriage rights throughout the United States? That's not really uh, the way to look at it, I think. The Ninth Circuit, uh, which is the appellate court that ruled in the case, said, took a very narrow view and looked at the specific uh, facts on the ground in California and took extraordinary pains to uh, make very clear that the only issue it was deciding was whether there are equal marriage rights uh, in California. So if the Supreme Court were to follow that tack, it would not necessarily affect the country uh, as a whole. There's also a procedural issue in the case. There are basically two arguments about whether the initiative proponents are the proper parties to be uh, defending Proposition 8 before the U.S. Supreme Court. One side basically says, look, if the state officials won't defend the law, then somebody has to, and the initiative proponents are the best people so that they should uh, be allowed to step in. The other side would say, 
look, we elect governmental officials to represent us. There's an attorney general whose job it is to rep the, represent the state in court. There's a governor whose job is to administer the laws, and both of them ran on a very clear platform that they were not going to stand by Prop 8, and they would argue in court that it should be overturned. And the people of the state, after Proposition 8, voted for them and wanted uh, that change in policy, and in a way, giving the initiative proponents standing thwarts uh, our right of access to a representative government. So uh, both sides have some uh, argument, but I, I think the, the idea that we need responsible government officials to represent us instead of unaccountable uh, people who may happen to support one initiative or the other has more weight. There were a number of appellate court decisions and trial court decisions that had found the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional and, uh, and had enjoined the government from enforcing the act in particular situations. So if the Supreme Court hadn't taken one of the cases that were percolating up, it would have meant that the act was uh, couldn't go into effect in certain parts of the country, and maybe it could in others, and it just would have created um, enormous disarray and havoc for uh, both for people in the country and for the government itself in administering the law. And it's an issue on which reasonable minds can differ. I, I think one of the really interesting things about the Perry case is that is what an, what an educational positive effect the case as a whole has had both on California and on the country in terms of making people aware that there's really no basis for any of these laws. I mean, they had, they had a trial that went on for some time with experts and really no one on the other side able to articulate uh, a good reason for having this type of discrimination. And that type of education then also forms part of the climate in which the Supreme Court will um, ultimately act. So when the majority creates a rule that has no basis and that is only designed to discriminate and hurt people only for, um, uh, for no objectively reasonable reason, that's when the courts step in. And so uh, we rely on that in, in this country and it's a very important fundamental reason why we have independent judiciary. We don't know exactly how they would write such an opinion, whether they would write it narrowly um, or broadly, and the exact words that they use could have an effect on some future case or another. But what I do think is clear is that politically, the tide really has turned in so many ways. Two very clear examples are the decision of the federal government to come in in the Defense of Marriage Act cases and support the unconstitutionality of that law. And at the same time, in the Proposition 8 case, the state of California believes that that law is unconstitutional and is asking the courts to strike it down. So I, having the responsible, elected, accountable political figures saying that these laws are unconstitutional and also unwise, uh, while, while the court won't rely on that, I think, for purposes of their analysis, it has to have an effect on how they view their role and, and their decision making. It's just a matter of time before same-sex marriage is recognized throughout the whole country. Whether it happens now with the Supreme Court or whether it's more incremental change at the ballot box and in state legislatures, this issue is, is coming around and, uh, and it'll be over soon.